One of the consequences of the liberating social change of the period was that makeup, which the Victorians had denounced as the mark of a loose woman, became increasingly acceptable. The new Edwardian woman needed a little rouge and a dash of lipstick to look up to date. The desire to look beautiful remains a constant through the ages, but what is considered attractive in each era differs. The art of beauty, we always want to do the same things. And what distinguishes the Victorian period from the Edwardian period is that you know, in the Victorian period, you were supposed to be perfectly beautiful with no assistance whatsoever. In the Edwardian period, you could use a little bit of help. By now, makeup was being sold over the counter in the new department stores, and the products were advertised to Edwardian women by actresses famed for their beauty. Actresses were seen as more acceptable by the Edwardians. Um, one particularly famous actress, Lily Lowtree, um, was actually noted very much for her beauty, and she really capitalised on this by lending her name to various beauty products, including face creams in this period. Lily Lowtree here, advertising pear soap, and she was apparently paid £132, which was exactly what she weighed. Lily Langtree's beauty was known to have caught the eye of the king, so it became a style to be copied. But beauty came at a cost. Makeup was not subject to any safety testing. Many new products made bogus claims, but were dangerous, and in extreme cases, a killer. The death of a young girl who had managed to acquire perforation of the stomach through eating raw rice, with a view to improving her complexion, the Edwardian woman was told to make herself beautiful, to catch her husband and to keep her husband. By doing so, she covered her face in poison. The dangers began before any makeup had been applied with face cream. An Edwardian lady had to have a pure lily white skin to distinguish herself from the suntanned working classes. And some of the most dangerous products are things like this. This is um, Harriet Hubbard Ayer Moth and Freckle Lotion. What is that? Moths were sort of liver spots. It was a, a, a 19th century term for liver spots and discolorations on the skin. And a lot of them are except, uh, well, pretty much camphor, bleach, ammonia, anything you could choose to sort of blanch your skin because you had to have a pure lily white skin. As late as sort of 1909, Vogue was advertising arsenic wafers, which you would take to get rid of, you know, any poor skin issues, and arsenic soap for that offending pimple. On top of these layers of poison, they put a dusting of toxic powder. Poisonous chemicals have very bright and distinctive colours. And so there were lead compounds, for example, that were very white. And so women liked to use it on their skin as part of a face powder. And that would be absorbed through the skin and could cause chronic lead poisoning. Different things were used for rouge. Uh, cochineal, which was made out of crushed insects, that's fine. But vermilion came from mercury. Mercury is a heavy metal and it's very bad for the body. It can affect several different organs, particularly the brain, the lungs and the kidneys. It can cause problems with sensation, um, unable to feel things, maybe unable to see, uh, and can cause you to go mad eventually. Even the eyes weren't safe. There was a product for darkening your eyelashes and your eyebrows, which actually made your cornea fall off, and several people went blind. One of the things that women liked to use in the early 20th century was belladonna. This is obtained from a plant, and when drops are put in the eyes, it makes the pupils dilate, which is meant to signify desire and arousal, and so made women look more attractive. One of the problems with this, of course, is that it's a drug, and when it's absorbed, it can have an effect on the rest of the body. At best, it would probably have caused blurred vision and a dry mouth, and at worst, a very irregular heartbeat and even blindness. You didn't know what was in these things. So There's no really... description of, of, of content or anything like that, because it, well, there was no legal obligation to do so. Mm. 
A lot of new treatments were encouraged at this time, all in the name of beauty. The crowning glory of an Edwardian woman was her hair, and to be truly fashionable, it had to be curly, coiffed and big, a process that often destroyed what it was meant to enhance. These elaborate hairstyles took a lot of effort, effort that inevitably led to unsafe practices with horrible consequences. At the inquest, Dr. Chaldicott stated that the dry shampoo was exceedingly dangerous owing to the impracticability of keeping the fumes away from the customer. There was a big problem in the Edwardian period of female baldness. Why were women going bald? People were using very dangerous hair dyes, which was one of the causes, but the other big cause, I mean, you'd have been fine with your fabulous curls, but everybody curled their hair. And so if you're doing that, so allow me to demonstrate, this would give you a sort of a crimp. Yes. For travelling, you might have a little one like that. So you were curling your hair the whole time, and the dangers of burning with this were absolutely extreme. Tongs like these were heated in the fire and applied straight onto the hair, often burning it off. But worse was to follow. Carl Nestler came up with the first permanent waving machine in 1906, but not before he'd burnt his wife's hair off twice. Goodness me. So definitely, there's a reason for baldness, if ever I saw one. Messler's wonder machine involved wrapping the hair around rods and covering it with alkaline paste and, most dangerously of all, asbestos. Gas was then used to steam the curls tight. It would take six hours. It was extremely popular. Once your hair was right, you had the challenge of adding a hat and so introduced another danger. Look at that whacking grey hat. You couldn't put your hat on your head without huge hat pins. These were up to 14 inches long. And that was another very dangerous thing because you've got all that incredibly sort of sharp pointed end. Ladies were banned from wearing unprotected hat pins on omnibuses in case they scratched people. Suffragettes had their hat pins removed when they went into court in case they stabbed people. And Edwardian novelists did do lovely little sort of vignettes of ladies preserving their virtue by stabbing an aggressor and a dirty old man with a hat pin. Ironically, while she was killing herself to look beautiful, the Edwardian middle-class woman was herself a killer of wildlife. The biggest killer in the Edwardian home was undoubtedly the Edwardian lady herself, with her taste for hats decorated with the most exotic feathers and sometimes even whole dead birds. Thousands of songbirds, egrets, birds of paradise slaughtered in the name of millinery. A public outcry led to the end of the fashion for dead birds on hats and to the establishment of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Birds in 1904. Women, however, continued to be the willing victims of the beauty industry. Bored, blind, burnt, scarred, Edwardian makeup was a dangerous business. In fact, the early 20th century was poised on the verge of the mass production of cosmetics and the explosion of a whole new industry one that would test their products first before releasing them on consumers. Standing on the shoulders of their ingenious Victorian forefathers, Edwardian inventors continued to expand the scientific horizon, and yet...